this specific uh, presentation, I want to go through building blockchains with the Polkadot SDK. Now, this is mainly uh, an intro. So Polkadot and the Polkadot SDK is really a really vast thing. There's a lot of technology in there. And while I've, I've refrained from putting in code in this presentation, so you should consider yourselves lucky, um, I'll be glossing over the introductions to some of these key concepts, but also in general when it comes to actually building blockchains and building layer ones. So it's not just something specific to Polkadot, but also concepts which carry over in really any other ecosystem. So just a short introduction about myself. My name is Badr Youssef. I'm a technical educator at the Web3 Foundation. Uh, you can reach me at any of those uh, handles there. So I'm going to start really basic, right? And I'm going to gloss over this quickly because everyone probably already knows this. But you know, what does it mean to build on Web3, right? And Web3 is kind of this, uh, you know, this, this kind of magical word um, where we associate a lot of this in terms with it, but it doesn't really mean too much. But essentially what we're doing is building a more intentional internet. That's fundamentally what we're doing. It's something which is intentional and um, actually has a backbone compared to the traditional current internet. And blockchains give us that backbone for the most part. It's not the primary way to implement a Web3 solution, but it is one of the fundamental ways. And a few concepts I want to get into your brain, because as an engineer, if you're going to be engineering blockchains, you need to actually be learning what these concepts mean, especially if you're getting down in the protocol layer, you're going to run into some of these terms. So for example, blockchains are essentially deterministic state machines. They move from one state to the next, right? And this state is dictated. If I give x input, I will always get y input. That's the meaning of something being deterministic. And blockchains additionally are also, of course, backed by game theory and economics uh, to where we can actually you know, somewhat predict the behavior of people, even though that's quite difficult in most cases. Um, but blockchains fundamentally are made up of these three components, of course, and also with cryptographic guarantees. We cannot forget that. And like I said, I want to stress that th they're supposed to be deterministic, and you'll see why this is important later. But they're not just you know, any state machine. It has to be a deterministic one. And a good example I like to always use is that of a vending machine, because once you get, um, you know, a vending machine has certain rules, and if you abide by those rules and you give it a certain amount of coins or input, then you'll always get uh, that same output, theoretically. And blockchain should work in roughly the same manner. And the primary use of even using these, right, uh, a common mistake that I've seen is people, they, especially when they're getting introduced to uh, using blockchains, is they want to use it as some sort of like distributed database or distributed storage, and that's not quite the right um, use for it, or it's not using it to its maximum capability. Really, the use of these distributed ledgers is for data integrity. We want to ensure that data is retrieved in the same state it was recorded. And we want to be able to do that across the board and generalize that, which obviously we have challenges doing that. Um, but that's what we want to get to eventually. And now before we dive into the layer one and protocol development aspects, let's look at the current state of Web3 for more context. So you can kind of classify very, very broadly, and maybe it's not fair that I put rollups on the same level as smart contracts, but you can kind of count uh, or look at the Web3 stack as this kind of um, uh, as this kind of layers. So you can have the layer zero, which is like a meta protocol like Cosmos or Polkadot, which connects blockchains together, connects layer ones together. Then you have the layer ones themselves, which are usually application specific. Sometimes they're generalized, like EVM is generalized. Uh, then you, based off of the layer one, you can build rollups and layer twos. You have smart contracts, which acts as your kind of middleware, and then of course your DApps at the bottom. So Polkadot, you can kind of think as, as a composer of protocols. So Polkadot will essentially allow you to grab a bunch of different services, compose them together into a single product, because the trust assumption is already there, because they're secured and backed by Polkadot itself. Since Polkadot connects different blockchains together, you can assume that all the blockchains connected by Polkadot and backed by its economic security uh, will be just fine to use. And on top of that, there's also cross-chain communication between all those chains automatically and a bunch of other things which normally would take you uh, quite a bit to consider. And now let's actually get into the meat of it. So the Polkadot SDK. Now, this is an overview of some of the things in Polkadot, and we'll be focusing on the top one called, I'm calling protocol land. Um, but essentially, you can also look at it as kind of three different stacks, right? You have user land, which are just dApps. You have uh, the second stack, which are smart contracts, right? Kind of the middleware of Web3. And then you have the protocol slash kernel land. And you can think of this as the back end of Web3. So layer twos, layer ones, um, uh, layer zeros, meta protocols, et cetera. So the Polkadot SDK is now uh, put into a single mono repo where you have all the tools you need to actually build all these things that I just talked about. So you can use um, 
Let's see. Oh, yeah, OK. So you can see here we have frame, we have substrate, cumulus, and then the actual Polkadot node implementation itself. So substrate is kind of the bread and butter of Polkadot. It's the, a set of libraries which take care of all the primitives and all the things you need to build a blockchain. You can think of it as kind of like a React, how React gives you all these different building blocks for building a website. Substrate kind of gives you all those building blocks, things like networking, um, defining a blockchain's runtime, blockchain storage, uh, upgrading the blockchain um, into one singular uh, code base. And that's what substrate, you know, a substrate is a foundation for something. So naturally, substrate is the foundational layer for you to build blockchains. The result, you get distributed state machines which can come to consensus. So you build layer ones. And then, in other words, you can also say that this is kind of a set of generic implementations for common components all across the board. And then after that, we have Cumulus, which is how parachains or how blockchains connect to Polkadot. So they have to abide by the parachains protocol in order to be part of the uh, Polkadot network. And Cumulus also built with Substrate. So you can see now that Substrate truly is truly the foundation of Polkadot. And Cumulus allows you to connect to Polkadot. And it's basically a developer kit used to build out these parachains. So now let's dive into what a substrate node actually looks like. Now you can see here it's made up of three main components. You have the client, which handles the libp2p kind of networking side, gossiping with other nodes. And then you have the runtime in the middle, and this is the part you'll be interacting with the most. And then you have the storage, so storing our blockchain's state. And each node uh, is always usually divided into these three categories. Now most of the time, we don't have to mess with the client or storage. We only have to use the runtime. And Essentially, the runtime is a WebAssembly blob. There's a, there's a WASM time uh, runtime inside of Polkadot, which takes these runtimes and ensures that the state transitions uploaded by a parachains are valid through this runtime. And the runtime is where you put all your business logic, right? You can customize your chain, build it however you like. And now to actually divide this runtime, now substrate runtime, you can build it just using substrate. However, if you notice, there's something else called frame which you will encounter. Now, frame actually, and it stands for Framework for Runtime Aggregation of Modularized Entities. It's a very long name. Uh, we just call it Frame because it's easier. But essentially, there are modules to build your blockchain with. So different types of modules, ranging from consensus to NFTs to even running a full EVM inside of Polkadot if you wanted to, are all, all implemented as palettes and modules. And then you can roughly see now how a runtime can come about. So you can actually either write your own palettes or include a set of already pre-configured palettes, configure them, and then all of those compile to WebAssembly as your runtime. Each palette's configuration can be changed. You can ch mess with this configuration, adjust the parameters. Um, let's say you want to set certain pseudo privileges to certain accounts. You can do that if you wish. Or you can also just completely remove uh, palettes. So let's say I want to remove the pseudo palette and put in some sort of governance system instead. Now, the whole goal of creating these runtimes right, is to create infallible ones. So blockchain runtimes on their own, uh, they should not be failing. You should not have a runtime which stops over some unexpected user input. So you as a developer should be in charge of creating defensive as well as infallible runtimes. And there's some you know, key things to keep in mind, such as using your blockchain storage wisely. Do not bloat the state of your blockchain. Only use very specific um, uh, pointers to items rather than the items themselves. And you want to use defensive programming as much as possible. You don't want to roll your own crypto, of course, and all of that to get to the goal of creating infallible runtimes. Now, as a use case to kind of put all this stuff together, I want to talk about Frontier. Now, Frontier is a native EVM compatibility layer inside of Substrate. And what it allows you to do is essentially run an EVM inside of a Substrate-based blockchain. So let's say if you wanted to upload Solidity-based smart contracts, then you could easily upload that if you have the Frontier palettes already included. And again, Frontier is implemented as a set of palettes. So you can see how extensive you can go. If you wanted to, you could implement um, other protocols as palettes inside of Substrate, thereby making your Substrate chain compatible with those protocols. You can see here that Frontier is made up of two palettes. So Palette EVM, which lets you actually upload Solidity smart contracts, and then Palette Ethereum, which exposes an RPC implementation. So you can connect MetaMask to a Substrate or Polkadot-based chain. And there's actually quite a few Polkadot chains which you can connect MetaMask to if you wish and uh, use an Ethereum account that way. So what do you need to learn to do all this stuff to create blockchain runtimes, to create your own blockchains, essentially? right? All of this is getting towards the goal of essentially uh, either creating your own solo chains or parachains. Substrate can be used for both. 
uh, you're not limited in that regard. It's a very generic set of tooling that allows you to take care of networking, consensus, storage, et cetera. All the hard parts of blockchain are taken care of for you. So, and I put this with four exclamation marks because the entire Polkadot SDK and ecosystem is all Rust based. So you're going to have to learn how to use Rust uh, and use it well. And some people have called some of the syntax inside of the Polkadot SDK like Rust V2 because it's a little out there, but the learning curve is definitely worth it. And of course, the willingness to learn this kind of generic way of programming. You're given this generic uh, implementation of consensus, generic implementation of networking, and you have to kind of put these things together. And, but as a result, um, you get an entire blockchain, which normally could take you months and an entire team, maybe even years. Now you can probably spin up a blockchain in about an hour if you want. Of course, the mindset is to innovate, create new things. So don't just copy code and then just you know, um, uh, use that as your basis. You can actually you have the, the ability to create something entirely new. And also, I encourage you to utilize existing solutions so, or bridge them together. So like I said, Polkadot, I like to view it as a composer of different things altogether. The idea is that you can create a product by composing all these things together. In some cases, you may not even have to build a blockchain yourself. You just can use, utilize the existing ones and compose them in a smart way. So what has been built so far using all these tools? Well, Polkadot itself is built using Substrate. And Polkadot is also built using Substrate, Cumulus, Frame, all these things that I mentioned. Polkadot itself has been built. And uh, you can see, if you dive into the Polkadot code base, it's very extensive and very uh, particular in the way that it actually, you know, it's a layer zero, a meta protocol, which validates the state of other protocols. So you can imagine how extensive Substrate is when you consider the complexity of that. And Substrate gives you those building blocks to create these decentralized systems. It doesn't even have to be a blockchain, uh, as we'll soon see. And of course, what can be built, you can build a fee blockchain if you want to. Again, you have full control over the, your runtime. There are specific macros, specific ways to configure the fees in your chain. Maybe you don't even want fees at all. And instead, you just want to use the economic security from Polkadot and use DOT as your, as your uh, method of paying fees. Maybe you want to implement a completely custom consensus mechanism, maybe something that has very fast finality. You can also do that using Substrate and then put that as part of your Substrate chain. You can replace the accounts model with the UTXO transaction model instead, like Bitcoin. And if you want to get you know, a little more specific, you can use like an IoT type supply chain traceability solution, like an app chain. So you can completely tailor just purely the business logic portion of a chain. And just some examples. So these are two system parachains. And respectively, um, should be switched around, but it's BridgeHub and AssetHub. BridgeHub is a parachain on Polkadot that manages the incoming connections from other bridges, other ecosystems. And then from there on, it uses cross, uh, cross consensus mes messaging to talk to other parachains using BridgeHub. And again, that's implemented as a parachain using substrate and frame and pallets. Same with AssetHub, which is an asset registry. And the point of these system parachains is to kind of uh, divulge the work from the relay chain, which is Polkadot. Polkadot. Polkadot's job is to validate the state of other protocols, uh, whereas these are application specific. A really good example of a solo chain built using Substrate that has a completely custom consensus mechanism uh, with DAG based consensus. I think they have like sub second finality or something crazy. Uh, is Aleph Zero, and they they are a solo chain, so they're not even connected to Polkadot, but they're using Polkadot's tooling to accomplish um, their consensus. And of course, Polkadot itself um, utilizes something called OpenGov, which is how decisions are made on how chains are to be upgraded, different you know, modes of funding and such. OpenGov is also built as a series of pallets, which work on chain and work intimately with the core protocol. And then lastly, just to get a little bit into this more of a fun use case, um, IoT and SubXT. So I've actually done this before. It's possible that you can take something like an ESP32, and if you know hardware, it's a very tiny chip, and you can compile substrate libraries onto that chip in order to create transactions, encode them, sign them, and then send them to a substrate-based chain. So you're going to have like direct transactions being created from a tiny little chip, sending up to a parachain, and that parachain then gets finalized by Polkadot. So you can see how you can really finalize and guarantee the state of many different things, because the tooling is just very diverse. So how do you actually start? Well, there's quite a few initiatives. So there's the Polkadot Blockchain Academy, which is essentially a five week, like super intensive program. Five weeks of nothing but blockchain and Polkadot. Um, you're sitting there with like 70 other people and you're just learning blockchain the entire time. Uh, it's a pretty rigorous entrance exam, but 
it's well, well worth it because you get to build connections, you get taught by industry leading experts, um, and you just spend all of your time learning the fundamentals. Like these things I glossed over in the beginning to do with uh, blockchains, state machines, you're going to be learning all of that at a really, really basic level, and it gives you that extra bit of understanding. Uh, we have the Polkadot Developer Heroes program. It's just a community of developers um, that use Polkadot, and it's a cool network you can go and talk to people about. You have, and then there's some upcoming edX courses. So we have two right now, and then there's two more where we're working on, which is an intro to Rust for Substrate, and then also uh, an intro to Substrate development. And of course, there's Substrate and Polkadot hackathons. We have a, I believe we have a, um, a bounty here for that. There's also treasury-funded Polkadot education initiatives. So if you go to OpenGov, if you're brave enough to put up a, pro a proposal to the community and propose something to build either add to Polkadot or build on Polkadot, you can do that as well. Um, yeah, and on the Polkadot wiki, there's like a starter's guide I put together where you can just kind of go through all of these different resources. And there's a QR code for that right here if you want to get started on that. And then there's one more I had added in the last second. It's a really good guide for, it's more development oriented. It's like a hacker's guide to Polkadot. All the different templates, node templates you can use. So you can actually like right now on your computer start a Polkadot node or a substrate based node, modify the runtime, compile it again, view it running, view its state transitions, everything like that. Uh, yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you guys.